as he's a man of many titles, uh, specifically uh, an educator, an author, and a community organizer. I've heard the term community activist, which I think is particularly powerful as well. Uh, doing just amazing, amazing work in Detroit. Notably, uh, Yusuf spent nine, nine years in prison. Uh, he'll be able to, to elaborate on that and, and speak to it much more directly, but had some very, very, uh, he, he'll be able to share his very, very powerful story about what happened to him uh, in prison that shaped his uh, current mindset as he emerged from that situation uh, to do the really amazing community work that he's doing now. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Jesus. Hey, my name is uh, Yusef Bunch Shakur. I'm a native Detroiter. So I'd like to greet you in my native tongue. What up, Bill? <laughs> it was an honor and pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, so the title is Let My People Go, Mass Incarceration. Um, I served nine years, I've been home 15 years. And any, you know, every time the, the, the opportunity to speak on mass incarceration, it's important that that challenge the audience of folks that we don't get caught up in slogans, that we don't get caught up in uh, titles or sayings. Because in, in reality, mass incarceration is a word that really doesn't describe what the fuck is really going on. You know, you talk about a group of mass of people that has been incarcerated, but in reality, we, we, we neglect ourselves and not looking at the social conditions of the communities that has been stripped of human lives. And so, so we starting at the at the end of the situation instead of at the beginning. The beginning of the mothers, the fathers, this community that has been stripped. And particularly when you look at the, the landscape of mass incarceration, the, the, the impact it has had on black and brown bodies over the last hundred plus years. You know, one we, 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 we celebrate and say that slavery was abolished, but that's some bullshit. The 13th Amendment says neither slavery nor voluntary servitude shall exist except as a punishment for a crime. It says, neither slavery nor voluntary servitude shall exist except for a punishment for a crime. So slavery was not abolished. So that's what, what oppression or oppressors do. They sophisticate or operate in ways to benefit them. We live in a society that's controlled and dominated by white supremacy. <coughs> so it created a, a power play to benefit them. So that was, that was in the beginning of the birth of mass incarceration. When folks that look like me, my ancestor, who was considered slaves, was, was when the Emancipation Proclamation existed, where we were so-called free, but we had no social skills uh, that were relatable to this, this society to be able to pursue higher goals. So what else was I, what, 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 what I, what I was to do? Either go and say, can I work for you for free, or go rob and steal. Cause I don't have a formal education. My pride say, fuck you, I'm not about to work for you no more. So I steal. So once, you, once I steal and I got caught, what happened? You locked me up. You fast forward, it's the same shit. The same shit in my community. You know, on the outside looking in, it's easy to, to sit on our couches and say, why, why are they game buddy? Why are they killing each other? You talking about a fucking jungle. You're talking about a community that's functioning as a dried up lake. And people are turned on each other out of survival. I mean, everybody in this room, if we, if we was just stuck in this room and it was a, and it was a storm and, you know, like shit, we're gonna panic, right? Every man for themselves. We're gonna, how, how to, where, where's security at? Where, where, where's the food at? This, this is because we really don't know each other in this room. But I know myself and I know my first, first law of nature to preserve myself. So this is what my mother did. My mother had to preserve herself the best way she could in an environment that was detrimental to us. I grew up in a single parent household. My father was doing whatever. So trying, trying to save me from myself, save me from my home. She beat my ass, she did. She, she came out of the blocks and cussed the older guys out. But my desire to hang in the streets was more stronger than my mama's rule. Not, it's not, I didn't love my mother. I loved the streets more. Why did I love the streets more? 
how, how, how do the streets become such a fashionable thing that it, that it becomes more stronger than the bond that you have with your mother? You know, these are questions that we have to begin to ask ourselves. Do we live in a capitalist society that shapes in young men and young women who have nothing and, and, and their self-worth becomes uh, a byproduct of a pair of jewels, becomes a byproduct of a pair of, you know, when I was growing up with Levi's. <laughs> You know, not now it's true religion. The guys ain't even got a goddamn religion. You know, pants cost more than the light bill. And I mean, this is what our society are shaping and fashioning of our children. How do you compete with that as a, as a single parent growing up in poverty? And, and the question that we don't ask is uh, how do poverty exist in, in America? Home of the brave. Y'all know that saying. I, I, I can't stand America. So I don't, don't even sound like home of the land of the honey or some shit. Ain't no honey for poor folks. There's only misery and incarceration for poor folks. So by the age 13, I've been kicked out of every Detroit public school I went to. I co-founded a gang in my neighborhood. You see, when I was in my community in my neighborhood, it just a just you know, JoJo, little redhead, little boy. I was under, no one acknowledged me. But when I started gangbanging, everybody acknowledged me. See, I had been condemned for gangbanging, but nobody ever came and asked me, why did I gangbang? See, that's the easy thing to do. Because in America, we're taught what to think instead of how to think. And by the age 15, my mother made me a ward of the state. See, that's the question that we, we, we look at and we, and we act like, so what's wrong with the parents? There's nothing wrong with the parents. It's, it's what the parents are up against. Again, my mother loved the fuck out of me. My mother beat my ass. She did whatever she had to do to try to save me without, without a question. Was it enough? Was it enough? Because reality, who was loving my mother though? Who could my mother go to? So when my mother made me a ward of the state, it was the only option she had to save me from myself. There was no pastor she can come to. There was no city councilman that she can come to. There was no mayor that, that she can come to that gave a damn. That said, I'm invested in this community. How can I help the, 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 the unfortunate, the downtrodden? Because because the to, to, to see the greatness of a, of a community is, is to look at the greatness of those who are suffering the most by uplifting them. But the little folks and little people in the city continue to get washed off. You know, we live in a society that throws people away. And so me being thrown away, I find myself in prison for a crime I didn't do. And fortunate enough in prison, I met my father for the first time. And that relationship that me and my father developed in prison had a tremendous impact on me redeeming and transforming my life. See, I knew of him prior to going to prison. But I knew of him as a sperm donator. I knew him as a guy saying, I'm gonna do this and do that and don't do shit. But as a father, that's who I met. And he passed on the lessons of redemption, of transformation. You know, in prison is the same. Either you're gonna do the time or the time's gonna do you. you know, it's the choice is yours. But that's a tricky, situation when we, we always throw down you got a choice, you got a choice. But how can you truly have a choice when you're caught up in the suspense of undevelopment? What choice are you, you really gonna make when you are survival? When you say I ain't got no food on the table and I got crack right here I can sell and give me some money to go rob. You know these, these are these are the choices that's predicated upon survival. Well you say well you know good and right or good and bad or whatever that shit is. Well, how do, what does that mean in the greater skin when I got hunger pains? My hunger pains gonna supersede good or right, right? Good or bad, because at the end of the day, I'm tired of going to home, going to bed hungry. I'm tired of going to my look, walking my neighborhood, people picking on me because they said I, I ain't got the latest shit. It don't take a a, a, a PhD, somebody have a PhD, to just go get a gun and say, give me your goddamn money. You know, I, I see that every day on, um, <laughs> on a movie. It don't, take, it don't take a lot to be able to go get a gun. 
You know, we don't ask them, say, why is it so easy to get a gun in the black community? We don't ask the question, why is it so easy to go get a, a sack in the black community? A genocide. That is what is creating and sustaining the prison system. Again, I challenge you, just don't get caught up in these things. The mass incarceration, the prison industrial complex, um, prison to school pipeline. I mean, I mean, that shit sounds dope. But you got to put a face to that shit. You know, look at my mother. You know, in the, in the nine years I was locked up, five of them I was denied a parole. Five times. Straight. And I was, and it wasn't, it hurted me, but it hurted my mother more. Oh, she goes, oh, she goes, I'm praying to Jesus. I'm like, it's, it's bigger than Jesus, mom. It's white folks that don't like us. That's a reality. I mean, prison is another form of lynching. It's another form of destroying human lives. That's what slavery was built on. That's what prison is built on. That's what America is. So if you're having a conversation about mass incarceration, the question that each of you have to ask why you came out, what is, what is your objective with it? Because reforming it is not going to solve it. Solve it. It, run, it runs too deep. Why? Because most of the prisons are built in, in, in white rural areas. It, it has become an economical sustainability for that white community. It's three, four generations that worked in that prison. You think you, you think they just gonna let you come change that shit? You think they just gonna let you come tear the clothes that shit? And you ask me, what was on that prison be, or in that be, in that area before it became a prison? It was a fucking swamp. You know, you when you just narrow it down to Detroit or Michigan in the early night or in the early up in the early nineties or eighties, there was only fifty prisons in Michigan. From the 80s to the 90s, you know, that they, they built like 20, 30 more prisons. Look at that time frame. I mean, where did, where did those guys come from? Majority of them came from Detroit. I mean, so it's much, it's so, it's much deeper than just mass incarceration. You know, again, we're going to talk from a societal, you know, you, you're talking about a, a base of people that no longer can vote. You're talking about a base of people that no longer, you know, we're talking about uh, census. Now they're not only being counted in Detroit, they're being counted in Ionia. That we say, I own your ass. That's just what it sounds like. But again, the things I'm saying was based upon my father being able to pretend penetrate my mind. And, you know, to understand within the black community, and I think you know, other ethnic groups really don't get it. We were stripped of everything. Our names, our religion, our culture. Our identity to not even love ourselves. Malcolm X said the greatest crime America has ever committed against black people is to hate ourselves. And we're still fighting and facing that today. So we're talking about a, a, a position of power. When we look at crime in the black community, a crime period, it's based upon economics. You know, when you when when, when the conversation gets to black on black crime, it's a fucking myth. There's more white people killing each other than black people. Why? There's more white people in America than black people. <laughs> Duh. There's more white people on welfare than black people. But when you look at the news, the media, they doesn't tell us that. Why? Why do they why do they want to paint the picture of black folk being uh, tied to that? It's, it's, it's not by accident. So this is the work that we have to be done. But the question is, are we committed to doing that work? Are we just committed to having a novelty of this conversation? I went to a mass incarceration. I heard this incredible story, and you're going about your life. That's not what I'm here for. I'm a revolutionary. I believe totally and totally completely should change the society. That's what I live for. For my son to have an opportunity it needs to come out of the fact that we created a new society that respects him. Because the playing field in this country is not, it's not the same. So, so getting to the heart of mass incarceration has to get to the heart of what do we believe? How do we see the next person? Because we, we, we always in, introduce in the conversation that we're all humans. We are. 
because not every human being is a, in the same fight that we in. Uh, we, we're reminded of our humanity every day when, when, when the cop is behind us. We remind about humanity every day when we, get this, when we go in a certain store. We remind about humanity the way we wear our hair, the way we dress, the way we talk. We're reminded of being black in America. And there's no running from that. So the question is, again, if you're, if you're saying you're going to be an ally, then you need to cross this line. Start fighting, start supporting, start engaging. So you ain't got to be from Harvey to help, but you damn sure got to give a fuck. You damn sure, man, we don't need no white missionaries. We don't time them out for that. We need people who's willing to support black leadership. When I say black leadership, I'm talking about folks who understand from a historical standpoint that now but was committed. We don't have that in the city. And how do you have a city that's, that's 80, 85% black, and you're talking about Southwest Detroit, 90% people of color, you got a white mayor. I mean, that's offensive. It is offensive. When I say, when I tell people, I'm gonna move to Livonia, you run for mayor. Most of us laugh, right, that's, that's, that's a joke. But he can come to Detroit. He can come to Detroit and, and run. And he, he runs on the back of, and I'm not a clowny thing, but the fact that the media slaughtered that man. They wasn't, he wasn't, they wasn't slaughtering him first, sir. It was slaughtering the psychological, it was a psychological warfare on the minds of black people. Because it would be when our community said, well, it's time to get a white guy chain. What do you mean get a white guy chain? You know, historical, I want you to look at this from a historical context. What does that mean? Have you seen the movies? You've heard, you've heard the saying? That's, 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 that's self-hatred that is worse. So there, 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 there's no person that, that, that's, that's uh, excluded of making mistakes. We're all, we're all gonna make a mistake. We're all gonna fuck up. But how long will we be continue to held accountable for our fuck -ups. How long is that we, we will continue to be the face of fuck ups? When you, when you look at political corruption, how do Tommy become the face of political corruption? Yeah, and I'm not denying none of the shit he probably did or didn't do. I'm saying, how do he become the face of that shit? You know, you got, you got people in Flint can't even drink the fucking water. You know, we just not getting you know, the media starting to pick this. We talking about this been three years though. They said, well, governor still walking free. Governor, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drink the water for a month. <laughs> okay, they've been drinking for for, for, for years. Just imagine if that was a black governor. Fucking national guards would be at his door. Again, yeah, this these, these are the realities of the society that we live in. So, so again, if we're not willing to address those things, what's the sense of having a conversation while mass incarceration? So all these things are tied into it. They all, they all interconnected. So for me, the work that I do is addressing those things, but doing it in a very realistic way. You know, my work is sitting around what we call restoring the neighborhood back to the hood. So engaging, or I intentionally went back to my community Essentially, you know, a community that's, that's under siege, that's attack, being attacked. You know, we're, we're, we're a prime real estate community in terms of surrounded by midtown, new center area, downtown. We've been neglected socially, politically, economically for 40 years. No investment. In one section of the neighborhood, Henry Ford has bought up all the, all the property. Nothing but manifest destiny all over again. America continues to, to reinvent itself at the expense of human beings. Capitalism continues to devour human beings. We accept it. We say we're human beings. If we're really human beings, then we got some work to do. And that's how we end mass incarceration. Peace.